Hi class, uh, it's Tuesday morning, <clears throat> recording our final video uh, for our semester. And I just want to start by saying thank you for all your work this semester. Uh, really nice job on all of the uh, unconventional self-portraits that I saw. Uh, just a reminder, uh, based on the kind of rushed nature of our uh, semester having nine weeks instead of the normal 11 or 12, we don't have a final project. So this week, rather than trying to rush a big final project, <clears throat> uh, I put this info in Canvas, but really you can just use this week to work on anything you may still need to turn in. You have the option if you turned in a project and didn't like your grade to completely rework that project. Um, you'll just turn it into the section on Canvas, the assignment that explains all the options for what we're doing this week. Uh, you can use this week to do some extra credit work. Everything's going to need to be turned in in either that extra credit section and or that, uh, that late work rework section uh, on your assignments before Thursday at 11.59, so right before midnight in a couple days. Uh, Basically, grades all need to be submitted and tallied up and put together before Monday morning. Uh, so it just doesn't leave as much time. So that's why instead of giving you till the end of the week, I had to do Thursday night. But any questions, you can email me. Uh, I know it's been a challenging semester in that everything is totally different up in the air. The whole world is different. Uh, so I appreciate you guys. I tried to not be too hard on you. and. Uh, you know, grade accordingly and, and not overload you too much with work. Uh, so that's part of the reason not doing the, that final project as well. So I just use this last week as an opportunity to kind of, you know, make up some points if you feel so inclined to do so. Uh, but I'm happy to meet like usual if you wanted to meet on Zoom and, and chat about some final things uh, today, tomorrow, Thursday morning. Um, probably be the last opportunity to do so. So shoot me an email, we can try to set something up. Uh, but for today, you know, the final project uh, traditionally in this class has to do with concept and the ideas behind your work and how you can communicate more effectively so that uh, unconventional self-portrait project is concept driven. It's about you without necessarily being a picture of you where, uh, you know, you can make a conceptually driven piece of art. It doesn't necessarily have to be about you specifically. I mean, ultimately every piece of art you make is gonna be about you to some degree because they're things that you care about and you're interested in. Otherwise, we, why would you spend the time making that work? So in a way, like, it's all, there's always some degree of, of self-reflection or, or even like self-portraiture that's in, in any piece of art because, you know, it's something that you feel is important enough to you that you're gonna spend time making a piece of work about it. Uh, so, you know, this slideshow is just gonna show you for your future reference on uh, continuing forward making artwork. Uh, like we've talked about since the beginning, just cause you can draw photorealistic, that might make you a good, uh, good technical drawer, but it doesn't necessarily make you a good artist. Being good artist is about being able to communicate these ideas effectively in a way that is, uh, thought provoking and and feels like it's more than just looking at a pretty picture. Sometimes you can paint a really gross, ugly picture or draw that and uh, it can be hard to look at. Sometimes art is confrontational. It, it brings to attention things that aren't necessarily easy to deal with, uh, talking about difficult subject matter. And, and that's okay. I mean, that's sometimes the most effective work that there is. So. We're going to look at a slideshow of a handful of different artists, primarily folks that are working in 2D medium, painting and drawing. Uh, there will be some installation and sculptural work, but not a lot, mostly because we're a 2D you know, drawing class. Uh, so I'm going to have this posted up into the assignment section, and there'll be a list of all the artists down below so you can follow up and look. I'm also going to post a couple of videos in there for you to watch if you're so inclined about a couple of the specific artists. Normally in this slideshow, I'd show you those videos as well um, through this process like we've done for some of the other, like we did that with William Kendridge. But you know, 
it's a long slideshow, so for the purpose of keeping the the length a bit down, um, I'm just going to post those videos, and you can you can watch. I'll, I'll in, through the lecture, I'll I'll let you know who when we get to the artist who's got a video and who doesn't, and you can decide to watch that if you want. I think some of those videos are nice for those of you that have been like looking around at the Art 21 videos because it explains the process, explains their, it's an interview with the artist explaining their ideas and concepts and what leads up to that work. You know, inevitably with a concept, um, unless you hear the artist talk about it, uh, you're just kind of make I, a lot of these people I don't know personally. A lot of them I do, and I've had discussions with them, and so I've talked to them about their ideas. So I'm able to communicate that with you. But a lot of those folks on there, I've never spoken with them personally. Uh, these are just the things that I've gathered from from their work, and we'll talk about why. Uh, even an artist that explains, this is my concept, this is my idea. If you're picking up something else from that, that's totally valid too. Uh, so there's things that are embedded in this like in your ideas that are just part of the collective consciousness that uh, everybody thinks about. It's all part of being a human being and, and the artist might not have intentionally put that in there. So, uh, you know, it's just about thinking a little bit deeper than, 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 the, than the drawing. Like, what are you looking at? What is it made out of? Um, how is it presented? What does it reference? What does it remind you of? What does it make you feel? All of these things. Uh, are, are important. So far we've talked a lot about, you know, technical sides of what makes a good drawing um, in, in these different ways of whether it's how they use the materials, being innovative. So, so in a way that's conceptual as well because a lot of art is about other art that's come before it. It's like drawing, sometimes concepts can just all be that kind of like self-reflective on the practice. Like we saw some artists that made these weird out there drawings that uh, in our in our first slideshow that don't look like much, but it's this conceptual reflection on what drawing is. Uh, what we see mostly in this, uh, we'll see some of that in the slideshow, but for the most part, it's gonna be, uh, you know, specific ideas or narratives that run through the work that we can kind of, kind of talk about. So I'm gonna share this screen real fast and pull up this slideshow. All right, so uh, the first artist we're looking at uh, is Gustav Klimt, and you probably recognize this image for those of you that have, you know, spent time looking at art, and even if not, like this is a really famous, one of the more famous paintings ever made. Uh, I see it a lot in posters and in uh, different kind of, I've seen it in advertisements. It just circulates a lot. It's a very famous painting, and uh, Gustav Klimt was, uh, an art artist from, I think he was from Denmark. I could be wrong about that, Copenhagen or somewhere. Um, but he was very much uh, making these pieces of work that reflected this kind of high society, uh, aristocratic, opulent kind of wealth, right? So like the the clothing that they wear, this, this painting is called The Kiss, and he's got some others that are really famous as well, but probably his most famous painting, but you know, the, the, the clothing that they wear is often gilded and gold. Uh, a lot of his work had a direct influence on the fashion of the time. So people would see his paintings and want to dress like his paintings. And he was very much involved in this like aristocratic, um, fancy, wealthy person uh, realm of society. And his paintings reflected that. Uh, through the use of figure. When I talk about figurative work, um, we're talking about work that shows people in it. It's, it's primarily showing the figure. Um, but he had a disciple, uh, a, a studio assistant uh, named Egon Sheila. And Egon Sheila shows the figure a lot, but you know, Egon had a very different upbringing than Gustav. Like he wasn't part of this aristocratic high society. He was very much that stereotypical starving artist type uh, trope or, or, or stereotype. Uh, so, you know, seems like, I don't know enough about his bio, but you know, his figures at least that he paints look like they're 
they're they're kind of knobby and contorted and dealing with this kind of like psychological distress of some kind there's this anxiety and and uh sense of despair in his figures through how they're contorted and just the overall kind of way that they're drawn so you know you can see that drawing the figure in different ways is going to read different ways uh you know the figures are often kind of emaciated and look like they haven't eaten in a while or are underfed and see their bones and their ribs and and they just don't look healthy so they have this kind of like desperation to the drawings where these are more kind of like fantastical figures from an artist named Brian Schneider. He makes very different work now, but he's a contemporary artist who lives in Joshua Tree. I think he's originally from New York or somewhere, but uh, he lives in the desert of Joshua Tree outside of Los Angeles. And uh, he was making these paintings and without getting too deep into art history, they reference different uh, eras in painting. So particularly Phobos painting, um, and if you're interested in, in this work, you can look that up a little bit more. We're not going to get too into that history, but have this kind of like loose, gestural, colorful, focus quality to them. But the figures almost have the sense of movement. Like you see, you know, multiple limbs um, reflected around the image, almost as if there's this kind of movement. But they're also kind of anthropomorphic. Like a lot of times it'll be the figure combined with uh, an animal. So it's like this anthropomorphic kind of combination of, of human and animal. Um, but his work has this like direct reference to this mysticism and mythologies of the desert. So uh, there's almost this kind of like occult nature to them. We see a lot of symbolism in there, of the, the moons and the birds and the plants. And there's this almost kind of like spirituality to it or kind of like ritualistic meditation happening um and something like really loose and nice about them i just have always been very attracted to these um, another artist primarily working with the figure is allison blickle and you know the first time i saw her work uh the title of the show was some i think was called uh, ritual magic we used to show at the same space in san francisco and that's where i was initially introduced to her work uh, through the show. I think the show is called Ritual Magic. So, you know, that title gives away a lot about it, but she composes these paintings of these female figures. Um, and they have almost these, like these references to if you've seen old hieroglyphs or, um, or even like Greek, uh, ceramic with the paintings of the different figures and these kind of like rituals happening one, uh, an object of significance being presented to another, figure. Uh, they're all very uh, female focused. So she pr is, I think, 100% of the time painting the female figure. But often there's there's other references to architecture, um, you know, through the through the use of these mosaics uh, across the laid across the figure, uh, a lot of reference to ceramics and and um, object or vase or or object of significance of some sort there's these different pedestals or or vitrines that we're seeing throughout the imagery um so it you know there's this narrative of something happening and something's occurring in these images we're watching something happening which is how we define narrative but we, we're not so clear on what that is you know there's references to different kind of like we said a lot ritual but m magic or mysticism or the occult and in, in a way that's not like a dark it, these don't read as like dark and you know evil it's more this like female centered kind of powerful energy i would i would say uh, this is an artist named Seth Armstrong, and he is a painter if located in Los Angeles as well. He does these, he does a lot of different kind of paintings, but um, his work has this kind of voyeuristic sense of the figure, not in like a creepy way, like you're creepily peeking through people's windows. Um, in some way, like yes, the, the female figure is in you know pajamas or lingerie or uh maybe lingerie is not the best word underwear or whatever it is um but it doesn't have that same kind of 
you know, maybe I'm misreading this as a guy, but it doesn't have that same, like, they're not hypersexualized figures. They feel like they're just comfortable in their own space. Um, so he gives us this kind of peek into people's private lives. Uh, and, you know, this is my opinion, like, you might disagree with that, and that's totally fine. And, you know, my perspective on this is tainted by, you know, who I am and my experiences in life. So it, it's totally okay if you if you read those differently. Um, but just to show you another example of that, like I think he, he he does a lot of figures of big kind of cityscapes and or drawings of, of, of paintings of big cityscapes. But I particularly like this image because it's got this kind of like voyeuristic sense uh, and this juxtaposition between the the micro and the macro. So like you're looking at this high rise apartment building and and in the glass windows you see reflected city and if that's los angeles or new york whatever like tens of millions of people all living their lives like a colony of ants you know in this massive city but you know in some of these windows are lit up and we kind of see these peaks in the people's personal lives whether maybe they're just cooking dinner or here someone's laying in bed or you know just just like pretty normal everyday life uh and so there's this push and pull and this contrast between like the individual life and this reflection of this like multitude or multiverse of of lives taking place outside of it so i think that's something that's really interesting about this work in general you know this is a close-up of that other image and once again like yeah i would say that it's not like a hypersexualized image yes they're half naked or getting dressed but who knows maybe they just woke up and got out of bed and like there's no it just feels very kind of like mundane regular life uh this is an artist named jean-pierre roy or jp roy i'm posting a video down below where he kind of talks a little bit more about his work um and it <clears throat> the video kind of feels really scripted, <clears throat> but it gives you a deeper sense into kind of the things that he considers and thinks about in his work. They're narrative, figurative work. So there's a story happening with these figures. They have this kind of fantastical, otherworldly sense. And so his work is a lot of, he, you know, he's very interested in like physics and, you know, theoretical phys physics and different theories of the universe and, you know, all the stuff that like intangible, unknowable kind of stuff that's out there that that kind of dictates how everything works that we can't really put our finger on or understand like what he talks a lot in the video about like showing something that's beyond our senses so like how do you create an image that you that you uh, consume with your senses that shows something you know it's almost an impossible task um but it it, it his work is very kind of metaphysical when i first found out about him he was doing these landscape it's almost like post-apocalyptic concept landscapes. Uh, and these paintings are huge and they're just insane. Like he has, he can paint, he understands how light works in this way. And, and he paints in this, this kind of like Renaissance quality way that not a lot of people um, are capable of doing or have much interest in doing anymore. Uh, this is an artist named Andrew Schultz been around for a while now and he does these his work is a lot he i mean he works in painting and collage and installation and sculpture and his work is a lot about you know different the systems that the world runs through like systems of power and oppression and war and money and religion and um all of these big heavy issues that you know kind of dominate what it means the human experience throughout history um and so he uses a lot of these kind of like symbols that you see uh you know ships and trojan horses and explosions um references to war and you know like brick walls and arrows and clouds of smoke uh you know, gold bricks, like all these different, the, the images have all these different references, but primarily I thought, I think a lot about like systems of kind of war and oppression. Um, you know, I'll, this is an example of how uh, the materials can be such an important part of what you're trying to say. So 
you know, this is a painting of that kind of like all seeing eye uh, with this figure kind of bowing down, praying to it. Uh, and he, it's actually painted over a stretched American flag. So um, rather than just using canvas, he's using an actual American flag to paint on top of. And there's, you know, in a lot of these paintings, you can see little pieces of money. He's actually cut up and collaged in thousands of dollars of US currency and he's got this like drippy gold blood looking so you know you can if it offends you or not um you know some people might be really offended by this image some people might you know really be inspired by it but that's kind of the point right it's provocative uh comments on like you know our country and money and power and oppression and all these things is like very dominant in his work This is a friend of mine named Robert Minervini, and his work isn't really figurative at all. Every now and then you'll see little figures in the, in the, in the painting somewhere, but they're more landscape or still life oriented. In this case, in the case of the images, uh, primarily landscape, some of them a combination of landscape and still life, but his work has this interesting kind of duality or contrast or push and pull between like a utopia versus a dystopia. Like are these urban, places is this like apocalyptic or is this place is it all falling apart or is this place being built as we speak so is it hopeful or is there desperation it's kind of hard to tell and that's where i think a lot of the tension in his work lies he uses these hyper saturated fake synthetic colors a lot that you wouldn't generally see in the landscape around you so rather than just gray concrete and blue or gray sky you've got you know these teals and neon pinks and a lot of that going on often see these like ghost images of trees so you do see a couple little figures in there um, which maybe references early kind of romantic landscape painting but for the most part you know there's a push and pull between like are you seeing the past present future or are they all just kind of folded on top of its itself so here we've got you know, this kind of like urban landscape feel and there's some kind of reference to still life work and, and painting here. I would argue that this also kind of brings up different questions of wealth and, um, you know, aristocratic kind of sensibility because you're obviously, you know, most normal people don't just have, you know, fancy ceramics and bus sculptures sitting in their house uh, unless you're wealthy, looking up from some high-rise apartment, probably. But, you know, the same questions apply here. Like, is this being built or is it all falling apart? Or did it start being built and something happened for it to stop being built? That's where kind of the tension lies in, in his work. It's like, is this a flood, flooded out city? Or are we just looking at the Bay Area, you know, the, the, the Bay from SF to Oakland? So this is an artist named uh, Mario Martinez. He goes by Mars One. He originally started doing uh, as a more street art oriented artist, but his work has moved into a gallery world. He does sculpture, mostly known as a painter, but he does some sculptural work as well, like huge brass, amazing um, sculptures. But his work is really abstract, but it still kind of has this landscape feel to it. And I would argue that it even has this kind of like space scape or universe scape kind of feel to it. Like, you know, it's hard to tell, are we looking at micro or macro? Like, are we looking under a microscope at cells? Or are we looking at this kind of massive universal or multi-universe here? Because we get this sense of like horizon lines, like maybe there's a sunset happening down here. Uh, but also they look cellular, right? Like they look like they could be little molecules, um, you know, here, multiple different landscapes, or it could almost reference water, but it's almost like, you know, even this looks like it could be a, a cell or, or uh, individual organism or whatever. So, so there's kind of like this push and pull between, you know, what exactly are you looking at? Is it abstract or is it a landscape or is it some kind of combination thereof? Um, you know, I, I would imagine that he thinks a lot about consciousness and, and multiverse theories, uh, theoretical physics, that kind of stuff would be kind of where my brain would go looking at these. 
but they're just incredible. I mean, and you know, some of these are massive, humongous paintings. They have this like luminescence to them, this glow that happens. That's just pretty, pretty uniquely his. So this is a painting by a artist named Frank Stella. Frank Stella's work is super influential and it is in every major museum, at least in America, if not around the world. Uh, he was mostly popular uh, or a lot of his, you know, more famous work came out of the sixties and seventies um, in these kind of like various abstract movements that we won't get too into, but, but ultimately, you know, these paintings are very much about painting and, and the sense of what a painting can be, what it has been considered, what it can be considered. Um, and, uh, you know, at a time where there was this like, you know, mass kind of production was ramping up in the sixties, uh, you know, larger scale of industry and, and global kind of economies. And, and this, these paintings, they are abstract and maybe the colors ref, reference, you know, different design movements or architectural movements, but, but the, the application of the paint itself almost looks mechanical. <clears throat> like when you get up for a while before him, painting was so much about this like thick gestural abstraction. You could really see the paint and the brush mark. And in here, in these paintings, they're painted so smooth that you can't even see the brush mark at all. So there's this almost weird push and pull, like is this made by a machine or is this made by a human? And that could be a commentary on, you know, factory industrialization of, of uh, products that we use in everyday life. You know, I'm just kind of diving in with the different um, theories here, but, but the work is about how it's painted and not necessarily what we're looking at. Some of them kind of play with your eyes a little bit in this op art, optical illusionistic way, kind of similar to how we saw with like a, we'll see some other examples that do that uh, pretty thoroughly here. Uh, but someone that was, I, I put a video of this artist in there as well uh, in an interview, uh, but his name is Jason Revoke. Uh, he is out there right now, currently living in Detroit, pretty famous artist, really interesting guy because he was a, for years, an extreme, one of the most famous graffiti artists in the world. And then he went to prison for a few years uh, for graffiti. And then when he came out, he started making fine art and his work has just kind of blown up. And he, in the video, he talks a lot about abstraction. He's obviously someone that's been directly influenced by like a Frank Stella, uh, but he talks a lot about abstraction and just kind of like leaving it, not beating you over the head with a concept and, um, you know, how like it's up to the viewer to kind of get their own perspective of it. And I think that that's fair. That's what he's thinking about. But at the same time, there's a lot of his personal experience and, and ideas, uh, whether he's willing to talk about it publicly or not. You know, in the video, he talks a lot about his, um, his experience in graffiti and this kind of like wild style kind of throw up tag stuff. Uh, but like, I would argue that these colors are, you know, very much, uh, very much have that reference to, to that kind of like wild style graffiti from the eighties and nineties, like very bright and bold and, and playful and loud. Um, and then in, and then in some of the work it has this, you know, being that it's like rooted in this kind of like urban street art kind of, uh, history there's these there's this type of kind of mark making that we see here that has this reference to the urban environment in a way where like you know this almost looks like a stucco wall or this could look like cement that's been troweled out onto the road before they you know whatever it is like there's a lot of strong reference to that kind of urban environment so you know it's hard to take yourself out of work completely you're making it for a reason so even if you know, an artist is saying, I want to leave it open to interpretation. They still have their reasons for doing it. And we can kind of come to some of those conclusions. Um, so this is a painter named Tauba Auerbach. I'm pretty sure she lives in New York now. Um, but she, these are paintings, right? And so they look 
when you see them in person, there's no, they almost look like a print. Like you can't even see the, the hand in it. So similar to a Stella, it's like, is this made by a human or are they made through a computer or, uh, or a machine? But her work, you know, started referencing kind of technology in, in the more like, in the way that we understand technology now, like digital um, computer technology rather than just like an industrial kind of technology. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, there's also these references back to like op art and kind of like this playing with the eye. But, you know, the reason I talk about this kind of digital technology references is because she was doing this pretty early on, like making these references and, 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 and drawing in those kind of aesthetics to her work. But, you know, early 2000s before that was commonplace where a lot of artists are making those like, how does the technology affect our everyday life kind of questions in their work. Um, what does it mean to be human when we have a computer with every all the information in the world in our pocket at all time? And so she was kind of early on in like making these, asking these questions. So this imagery almost has this like glitch aesthetic to it a little bit. They're just large paintings. Um, this is an artist named James Turrell, and he does... His work's in a lot, he's super famous. He does these light installations and they play with our sense of reality and where we are within it. Um, the way that we understand the world around us and experience it through our, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, senses. Uh, so his work is presented in these museums and generally you have to wait in a long line to get in because only let a couple people in a time. Cause if there's so many people in it kind of ruins the illusion a little bit, but get the sense of like weird depth of like you're looking into infinite space, but it's also kind of flattened at the same time. So, you know, the work has these references to this kind of like almost Stella esque, um, simple, like formal abstraction, but you're, you're inside of it. And so, you know, it's almost like, can you reach through this wall or, or are you going to walk into the wall? Um, this image is helped a lot by the fact that we can see the space through the figures standing here, where if we couldn't, it would almost be hard to tell if there were no figures there, is this flat? Are we looking at the flat wall or is there actual space? So yeah, almost like looking through these portals uh, through the roof or through spaces. So in some cases, there are spaces you can walk into, and in other cases, you feel like you can walk in, but you can't. Uh, this is an artist named Felipe Pantone, or Pantone, I'm not sure how he pronounces that, but I initially met Felipe because uh, we shared a booth in Miami together uh, for the Art Basel in like 2015 or something like that. And he's another person, really prolific, smart artist who started in graffiti and worked his way more into fine art world. But, but like a Tauba Auerbach in a more kind of contemporary way, he's got these really strong references to kind of digital communication. Uh, so they have this kind of like sense of, of, of contemporary technology, but they also kind of have this like throwback, these images in particular, throwback to like 80s kind of glitched out computer screen kind of aesthetic. Um, and then, you know, his work's pretty different now and it's a lot more streamlined, but these are some older images. But then it presents itself in a gallery. This is an older show of his where, you know, these objects looking at this picture, they, they almost look fake or it, it looks like it's Photoshop. So similar to a James Trail, you walk in and you're, you're disoriented. Just the way he's painted these and placed them, that happens in the space where it feels like you're walking into some kind of virtual glitchy landscape. So this is an artist named Damien Gilly. And Damien is actually a... Uh, adjunct teacher here at Clark. Uh, and so if you ever have the opportunity to, I think he teaches mostly like digital design classes, but if you ever have the opportunity to take a class with Damien, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, his work is very much about perspective and place and orientation and um, 
unfolding kind of realities on top of itself on top of themselves. So like it has this illusion to it where, you know, this, you can see if you look around that this is built into the corner of a room, but the, but depending on your perspective, when you're standing in just the right spot, things line up and then it pushes weird, uses perspective and it pushes space around. So you get disoriented of where you actually are in the space, but you know, you move to the right or left a little bit and the illusion is broken. So here's another example of kind of how that's working. He'll actually like build out the walls a little bit. Um, this one's less so about that perspective, uh, that like traditional, you know, vanishing point perspective and more just about your individual perspective based on where you are in the space, creating a new composition. So, you know, right now we're seeing one composition of the space, you move to the left or right, that composition changes. So you're very much involved and an active participant in these uh, images. I like this one a lot, it's uh, strings that are illuminated. And when you're standing in one particular space in the gallery, you can see this X. When you move to the right or left, that X disappears. So once again, it's the interaction with the piece, your your involvement and role and in, in the experience of, of witnessing the piece based on where in the physical space you're standing. So, so obviously some of that gets like conceptually heavier than just straightforward, like this is about war and oppression or this is about beauty or this is about, you know, this opposition of beauty and the grotesque. Sometimes they're a little bit more kind of like intellectual and heady, but, but this is an artist named Patrick Martinez. And I would argue that he's one of the more important young artists working today. He's based out of Los Angeles and his work has this kind of like sarcastic humor to it. And it's very much about, you know, being um, Latino, living in primarily Latino communities and the kind of different stereotypes around that, that he sees around him and the people that from his culture. So a lot of the work, it's like a painter and a sculptor and a lot of it, it's like neon, neon signage. It's like specifically in LA, you see a lot of these kind of like neon signs in the windows. Um, and so, you know, it'll be, you know, there's just humor to them, like get cake homie. So he uses the slang and then shows the cake, but, um, or, you know, a, a painting of, of what looks like could be Jesus in the background, but maybe he's wearing like a button up flannel. It says pure hustle. That's Patrick right there. Um, these ones I think are really powerful because it's an installation. And if you ever spend time like in East LA and you've seen all these little bodega stores everywhere, like the colors are that that the walls are painted are just like really bright. And there's always these bars on the windows with like neon. And so, you know, it's this kind of like direct reference or representation of those places. But you know, it says forbidden fruit in neon, and then you know, there's these traditional tropes of like, we've seen a lot of examples of still life painting. And so he's got a still life painting in there, but instead of, uh, you know, it being these like fancy meats and charcuterie and, you know, fancy fruit and wine, it's Colt 45 and, you know, great drink and Takis and Funyuns and stuff. So there's these like commentary on, you know, wealth and um, fine art and, Oppression and a lot of things kind of worked into it and, and stereotypes. Uh, same here. So there is the bowl of fruit, but you've got like a, a Glock or a, some sort of handgun and a, and a bottle of Old English. So, so once again, like playing uh, off perceptions and st cultural stereotype and making commentary thereof. Uh, it's an artist named Sergio Garcia. And his work is similar to Patrick Martinez, except it's 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 less heavy. It's more about um, about specific culture, uh, a lot of like hip hop culture and uh, the motifs that and kind of symbols surrounding that. So he does these like hyper realistic sculptures um, that reference, you know different kind of cultural phenomenon and, and interests. Uh, this is an artist whose work is probably, you know, more relevant now than ever, but um, his name's Cleon Patterson. 
Clayton Peterson, and you might have seen his work around a uh, super famous artist, uh, does these kind of graphic depictions of violence. Um, like, I think it's an older image, but they're, they're very, you know, there's like two black, white, maybe one other color. For a while, he was doing a lot of these like black, white, and reds. A lot of them are black and white. Now, black and white and gold or black. They're, they're really simple and they're graphic. And often the figures, like you can't tell who these people are, or like what race or what kind of creed. It's just these like brutal acts of violence. And they can be hard to, to look at, but it is this commentary on the perpetuation of violence in our, our in all societies, just part of human beings. Um, but there's these other symbols, symbols like the reference to the horse and, and these weapons. Um, a lot of times, like in the older images, it'd be directly, you know, there's more information there. Like obviously this is a, these are police officers or they're in uniform of some degree. Uh, and the newer ones, there's less to pull from of like who they are, uh, just like strewn about trash and, and whatnot. But, you know, oftentimes it's like just, these kind of horrific scenes, but um, they're very powerful. Uh, this is a friend of mine named Ben Baumgartner. He goes by Ben Venom, and he does these giant quilts that are made out of old heavy metal shirts and, and different kind of fabrics that will reference like biker gangs or um, like the occult or tattoo culture or uh, like heavy metal, so there'll be like leather and and stonewashed denim and old heavy metal shirts, and the the imagery is very much like aggressive. And the funny thing about them is, you know, they're quilts, so it's like the kind of thing you would think of your grandma making, but it's like super hardcore. So he often refers to it as this like kind of razor's edge of, um, you know different extreme culture, whether that's, you know, NASCAR or WWE wrestling or heavy metal and these like kind of occult fringe kind of societal things all brought to you with this like super wholesome craft of quilting. Well, you can see how big some of them are. So like close up of a quilt versus him standing in front of one of them. And he's shown these in museums all over the world. And the final artist I wanna show you is a woman named Zaria Foreman. Uh, she's a New York artist, very interesting uh, work that, just to show you an example of like how an image can mean so many different things. She does these hyper-realistic drawings of, from photographs that she's taken. You know, she's gone on uh, National Geographic Explorer kind of expeditions, uh, into the Arctic or to Greenland or these kind of places and photograph these icebergs. And her work is very much about um, climate change and environmental kind of catastrophe. And it's as simple as just showing these glaciers. So there's this kind of cold, solemn, like almost darkness to them that pervades. And, um, you know, she'll actually name them after but there's beauty in that too, and they're named after the specific glacier. And if you research that glacier, you you know you know it's one that they're talking about because it's way smaller than it used to be. All that kind of stuff. So, so just to show you, like a landscape can be presented in a lot of different ways, and it can mean a lot of different things. Same way that a horse can be presented. Like a horse can be a symbol of, you know, the Wild West. It can be a symbol of of war or the the war horse. Uh, and aggression. It could be a symbol of power and beauty. It could be a symbol of like pastoral rural America. So depending on how you drew a horse, uh, where it is, the position of it, the, the, the angle of your view on the horse, it's going to read a lot of different ways. And that can be said with all imagery. So basically, uh, that's our slideshow. And, and those are just a handful of artists. Like, you know, I encourage you to think about, as you look at art, what do you think that this person's trying to say? What are they trying to get across? And, and then question that in your own work as well. You know, I've had 
it's so important to have a concept or something that you're passionate about that you're communicating in your in your work as you move forward uh, after this class if and when you move forward and continue to make art because ultimately you know you hear a lot of people talk about writer's block or artist block and it's like well i don't know what to draw i don't know what to paint it's like well if you have something that you're passionate about there's always something that you can pull from right and that might change over time or that evolves or you might have one thing that you could work on for the rest of your life but if you're looking into that watching movies that relate to it uh reading books you get ideas write sketch do all these things and then you'll never be in a position where you're sitting there and you're like i don't know what to draw if anything you don't have time to draw the things you want to draw uh, so that's the importance of it outside of just communicating and making a nice piece of art it's a way for you to stay working and busy and effective so yeah all the artists posted below not on youtube but in the uh assignment page really appreciate all your guys work this semester uh, like i said i know it wasn't easy not actually meeting um so yeah, just appreciate you guys. Let me know if you have any questions in the next couple of days and grades will be posted by or before the weekend. All right, thank you.